co-chair of the Sacramento County Opioid Coalition, along with my co-chair, Lindsay Cote, who's on screen right now. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to our quarterly meeting and just you know, briefly, if, you, if you're joining us for the first time, you know, the Sacramento County Opi Opioid Coalition, it's a collaboration of healthcare professionals, community-based organization, law enforcement, county agencies, and concerned citizens uh, determined to turn the tide of, our, of this local opioid um, epidemic. And so uh, your presence here today um, is, greatly appreciated um, as we all are, you know, joining together to, to, um, to fight the, uh, the opioid um, epidemic. So uh, we have a really nice agenda today and um, we are going to start off with our community updates. Uh, Lindsay Cote, would you like to start off? Sure. Um, we just wanted to share with you all very briefly that um, we do have an opioid awareness summit planned for Tuesday, October 11th. It'll happen at um, Sacramento State University. And the intent of the summit is really to work with the educators in our community to um, inform them you know, about the latest data trends in opioid use. Um, we'll have some presentations from law enforcement uh, to discuss ongoing trends um, within our youth, um, uh, some really great presentations on risk, risk factors that increase the likelihood that a youth could misuse or abuse. Um, an opioid, um, we'll talk about prevention and intervention strategies, and um, really have some resources ready um, for individuals who are looking for that to, to bring it into their classroom. I'm gonna drop a link um, into the chat. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. I'm gonna drop a link into the chat um, that goes directly to the Opioid Summit webpage um, for registration. Please share this far and wide. Um, it really is, again, meant for educators, um, but it's, it is open to everybody um, in the public. And we are working um, to uh, meet with the Sacramento County Office of Education to try and get um, this to be an in-service for the teachers that would like to attend. So they're not taking um, time off from their students. So that's the goal, um, fingers crossed. And I think that's about it, Janet. Okay, I'd just like to add, um, you know, as it says in the flyer, uh, this opportunity is free, uh, but you must be registered. Um, we are not taking any walk-ins on the day of the event, but um, you know, to please um, you know, register with the link in the chat and also um, uh, you know, spread the news around. And uh, we hope to see you on October 11. Thank you, Lindsay. Okay, and so um, also I wanted to, to let everyone know that we will be sending out a survey to this group soon because uh, we really want to know the perspective of you, our community, and all who come to these meetings and uh, share in this coalition membership. You know, you are all very, very important to the success of this coalition, and we value your help to identify what direction uh, we need to go in and find out, you know, who and what uh, we can do to, um, you know, support our, our mission. So your input is important and um, it helps lead us to, to be a more successful coalition and allow us to strongly combat the opioid epidemic. So numbers and fatalities are on the rise and working together is the most effective way that you know, we are gonna get through this. So please um, look for the survey um, to be coming out in the next few weeks. And uh, again, your responses are very important. And um, if there's anything you'd like to see from this coalition, um, you know, we'll you know, do our best you know, to incorporate it into our meetings and some of our programming. And so if you have any um, questions on that, um, you can just um, throw it in the chat. And um, we look forward to, to hearing your responses in the future. So 
Let me check the chat. No, I don't see anything. So um, we're going to go ahead and um, I'm going to introduce our, four, our, our first speaker. Um, and so I'd like to introduce uh, Nicole Harper. Uh, Nicole is a licensed marriage and family therapist who has been working with the community mental health providers since 2011. In 2018, she joined Sacramento County Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Unit and is currently the supervisor of the adult system of care. So um, let's welcome um, Nicole, who's gonna give a uh, Sacramento County Health Opioid Data Update and Overview. Thank you for having me today. Um, we have a lot of exciting things happening with um, SUPT unit. Um, April is Alcohol Awareness Month. We have a Alcohol Awareness Month toolkit, um, which has a social media content involving alcohol and opioids. Um, I'll send out all the different websites in the chat. April 30th is National Drug Take Back Day. Um, so save the date. We have our Spring RX Drug Take Back Day will take place on Saturday, April 30th. Um, and we also encourage everybody to take the following steps, uh, lock up any type of medications, keep them out of, say, um, out of sight, keep them in a safe and secure place, um, monitor your medications and take only as directed, uh, monitor any remaining doses, and again, don't share medications with others, um, take back or drop off any unused or expired medications to the designated collection sites, um, which again, I will put in the chat. Um, and I'll put the poster in the chat as well. We have updated coronary data. Um, so in 2020, 1,960 deaths were reported. And out of those deaths, 88 were fentanyl involved deaths while 198 were meth-involved deaths. Um, in 2021, the fentanyl deaths increased to 116 deaths. So in 2021, we had a total of 2,171 deaths. And again, um, the fentanyl-involved deaths were 116 people, while meth was still leading at 196 related deaths. Um, and the start of 2022, so between January 1st and April 11th, 11th of 2022, we had 578 deaths, um, 25 of which were fentanyl-involved deaths, and 35 were meth-involved deaths. Um, that is our updated data from them. Our meth coalition is May 12th. We are also continuing our fentanyl initiative with the DA's office. And um, we are working on getting Narcan in schools, as well as the Song for Charlie curriculum in schools. Um, we are planning to do another town hall meeting, possibly at the end of May. And if you're interested in ordering um, Naloxone, you can go to the Naloxone Distribution Project uh, website on DHS, DHCS. Um, again, I'll send or I'll add the website in the chat. And May is also National Drug Court Month. Um, we also have a new fentanyl flyer from Alcohol and Drug Advisory Board, Avenging Subcommittee, subcommittee um, which again, I'll add in the chat. And that is it for me. Thank you. Okay. Does anyone have any questions or comments for uh, Nicole? You can either type them in the chat, raise your hand. <laughs> Nicole, um, actually, I do have a question for myself. Do you, 
um, know about how much is collected at these take back days. I know it's like some extraordinary number. Yeah. I don't have that number yeah. in front of me. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. Because I know it, it's usually like millions of tons mm -hmm. of of medication. So it it is a um, very very well uh, utilized um, service. And so um, you know, we again we encourage people to. Um, spread the word and have them, um, you know, look um, on the county website and also at the DEA website, they could find um, centers that um, you can drop off uh, unused or expired medications. And then there's also um, local pharmacies um, that you could that have bins that you can drop off um, unused or expired medications as well. Okay. And then um, in the chat, they're asking that if you could add the link to the Met Coalition in the chat as well. Okay, awesome. And then we have a question. Are there any age specific trends for the meth deaths versus the fentanyl deaths? Um, there are, let me get that really quick. I have a question to Shari. Hi, Shari. What do they do with all those meds? They're being destroyed. They're being pulverized. So, so I'm gonna take I, home. Yeah, that's a very good question. I know they have a procedure for disposing of them properly. I don't know quite what that is. I know they work with medical uh, facilities. That's why um, not just anybody can be a host site to collecting them. It's you know they collect them under pretty. Um, regulated conditions. And then, yeah, I don't know if anybody else out there in the medical community knows. Oh, looks no. like uh, Nate. <laughs> Hi there. Nate Pelzer from the California Product Stewardship Council. So we just, uh, so we have a, a campaign called Don't Rush to Flush. And it typically involves uh, the placement of a med bin, a safe disposal med bin. And uh, the pharmaceuticals that are collected in those med bins are taking, taken to an incinerator facility. That's the most ecologically sound way to dispose of those. Uh, that way they don't get into the, the water system and the water stream. Uh, they don't leak through any kind of dump or storage facility. Uh, so that most commonly is the way that they're disposed of and disposed of in the most, again, ecologically sensitive way. Okay, thank you, Nate. And I have um, the age-related stats in front of me. Um, so the most in 2021, the most deaths occurred at... Um, those who were 21 years old. So we had seven deaths in 2021. Uh, the second leading age would be 31 years old um, at six, tying with 33 years old at six deaths. Um, the next one would be 35 years old at five deaths. And that is also the same as 39 and 40 years old. And then it decreases with age, um, but between 21 and 41, there is a pretty significant average of about four deaths per year on average between that age. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Nicole? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Nicole, for your presentation and that information. And now uh, we'll move on to our next presenter. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Michelle Vesey. Uh, Michelle is a program planner with Sacramento County in the Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Services Department. Michelle is, is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and she has been in public service for over 20 years. And so um, Michelle will be giving a presentation on Sacramento County 
healthy beginnings presentation. Thank you so much. So my name is Michelle Bessie, and I'm going to talk to you about the seven perinatal enhancements that we have. One of those, which is um, Sac County Healthy Beginnings. So just to give you guys a little background, um, Sacramento County received the Coronavirus Response um, Supplemental Appropriations Act funding, also known as CURSA funding, which was approved on February 8th of this year and must be spent by December 31st of this year. So we have a pretty short amount of time to, um, you know, to really execute these projects that we have going. Um, so SAC County Healthy Beginnings is our biggest initiative out of the CURSA funding and our top perinatal enhancement. The vision and mission for this is empowering Sacramento families to thrive physically, socially, and emotionally free from effects of substance use and misuse during pregnancy. Sacramento County Healthy Beginnings will promote a healthy and safe environment for Sacramento County's family and children through outreach and education for professionals, community members, addressing perinatal substance exposure, prevention, and intervention. So just to give you guys some stats, in 2016 through 2018, the maternal and infant health assessment, 7.5% of women disclosed alcohol use during the third trimester of pregnancy, while 4.7% of women disclosed cannabis use during pregnancy. SAMHSA, during their 2013, unfortunately, that's the last data that we have, the most up-to-date data, reported 5.4% of women were using marijuana, 9.6% were using tobacco, 9.5% were using alcohol, and 0.4% of women were using opioids while pregnant. So this is a huge concern. In Sacramento County specifically, between 2017 and 2019, the um, Dependency Drug Treatment Court clients 30% of them, methamphetamine was their primary drug of choice. With early intervention family treatment court, we found that 23% of clients, methamphetamines was their primary drug of choice. In a study on methamphetamine during pregnancy, we found that it was the most commonly used substance during pregnancy. And that out of 144 infants exposed to methamphetamines during pregnancy, only 13% of them tested positive at the time of birth. So we found a huge number of infants who were being prenatally substance exposed to methamphetamines, but they were going unidentified because they weren't testing positive at birth. So looking at Sacramento County specifically, between 2016 and 2022, we found 1,677 reports of prenatally substance exposed infants in Sacramento County alone. And those are just the infants that were reported. So what do we currently have here in Sacramento? We have an options for recovery program, which includes residential treatment, recovery residences, also known as sober living, intensive outpatient treatment, outpatient treatment, and recovery services. We also have specialty programs through our medication assisted treatment provider for pregnant women. So some of our service gaps and needs is we have a high rate, oh, there we go. Sorry about that. We have a high rate of prenatally substance exposed infants here in Sacramento and children who could benefit from specific interventions for prenatal substance exposure. We also don't have um, a specific screening tool for prenatal substance exposure during, during pregnancy. And the information of prenatal substance exposure on the developing child and adolescent is not readily available or used in Sacramento County. Our goal is providing consistent information among different disciplines through Sacramento County providers and we would like to give a common language to understand children with prenatal substance exposure. So some of our proposed goals 
and is a screening tool for pregnant women to identify potential substance use and refer for early intervention and treatment services. We are looking to implement what's called the Four Ps Plus, which is a validated, um, a validated screening tool. We also want to provide education to professionals in the community who act with and who interact with pregnant women whose substances and whose children have been prenatally substance exposed. We are looking to provide a media campaign for providers, encouraging them to increase their knowledge regarding prenatal substance exposure. This will also include articles in the Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society magazine. And we're aiming a specialized media campaign targeting women who are pregnant in Sacramento County, encouraging them if they are using substances to seek treatment early. So our timeline for this, we actually had our first big training um, on April 12th, which is an overview of prenatal substance exposure. But just in case you missed it, it's not too late. We have a number of trainings coming up. We have trainings in May, August, and November. We also have a stakeholders meeting coming up, which everybody is welcome to attend. And I will drop the information in the chat if you would like to sign up for our stakeholders meeting, which is going to be May 3rd, 130 to 3. One of the things we're going to accomplish at our next stakeholders meeting is to design a specialized training series. These topics will be chosen um, by a survey, which will be conducted on May 3rd. So just again, um, stakeholders meeting May 3rd, 1.30 to 3. So that was our Sac County Healthy Beginning. Here are some of our other prenatal or um, perinatal enhancements that are happening through the CURSA funding that Sacramento County received. We are also doing ACM training. We had ACM books for all our treatment providers, Dr. Mi Lee, who wrote the ASAM book, came and did a training. We will have trainings for, available for all our contracted providers. We have a motivational interviewing training, um, which will occur April 20th, so later this week, from 1 to 3. That is free for everyone in the community, and I will drop the flyer for that into the chat. Again, anyone in Sacramento County is welcome to attend a free motivational interviewing training. We also have parenting curriculum and activities that will be updated in our Options for Recovery program, a prevention and media campaign, working with our current prevention providers and Sac County Healthy Beginning to really distribute information to transitional age youth, aiming at um, arming them with the knowledge of prenatal substance exposure to make sure that when they become pregnant or are parenting, that they know the dangers and are able to seek treatment early. Perinatal cancer number six is working with Sierra Valley, Sac Sierra Sacramento Valley Medical Society to increase MAT education for med the medical community. And our final perinatal enhancement is an update to the Mather Community Campus Recovery Residences. So updated furniture and appliance for those units out there. So those are Sacramento County's seven perinatal enhancements. Any questions? I'm gonna, uh, if you have any questions uh, for Michelle, uh, if you want to drop them in the chat or. Okay, wonderful. And I will get the flyer for um, the May training and the, inter uh, the motivational interviewing training. I will drop those in the chat. And again, anybody in Sacramento County is welcome to attend. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and also in the chat, there's a little update to the drug take back. It looks like 
Sac County, they we collect they collected eleven thousand three hundred and forty five pounds of medication just in Sac County. So that's pretty impressive. I've uh, got that out of medicine cabinets and off the street. Um, and then we have um, Nicole's information uh, also in the chat. And so make sure you do take note of that information. And any other questions? Oh. Okay. All right. And so uh, let's see. Our next speaker, uh, who's um, going to uh, give us her personal story and lived experiences, Brittany Cox. And um, Brittany has lived the experience of opiate um, addiction and showed tremendous strength to overcome her addiction. She hopes that by sharing her st story, um, it could be found valuable to others who are also working to overcome their addiction. And so um, let's welcome Brittany and Brittany, uh, go ahead and thank you for being with us today. Thank you. And it's uh, very great to hear all your guys' um, information that you guys are giving out. It's great. The programs that you have going on right now, it's it's huge. I know it's a huge ordeal out there right now with the opioid epidemic that's going on. Um, I was addicted to uh, heroin at a very young age. I um, kind of went through some traumatic experiences when I got addicted to heroin. Um, I had a brother that was a addict as well, and he had kind of collected a very large debt with some very scary people who came to my house and held me responsible for that debt. And I was raped, didn't want to be myself anymore. Um, and it caused me to, you know, dive into my addiction just head on. And um, it's just, it's a terrible thing right now out there. And it's so sad to see so many people dying because fentanyl is such a problem right now. Um, I know that for me, um, I don't think I would have gotten clean had I not worked through my trauma. Um, and I know that's a huge thing for a lot of people. Um, and so I really feel like we need to have more um, just trauma therapy available to more people out there. Also, um, the other thing that I have been finding um, as a newly sober person um, is housing. Uh, another really big issue we have right now is housing with um, all the programs there are right now. Um, I have several people that I know who have been trying to get clean who are in these housing programs and they're just surrounded by people who are using in these housing programs. And it's very, very sad to see because all this funding is going into these housing programs for people to be just, you know, abusing it. And, um, you know, when there's people out there that really are trying to do the right thing and, and better their lives that need it. And they're having to battle that every day. And it, it's just a sad thing to see. Um, I don't know what the solution would be maybe, um, to require maybe drug testing for people who are getting that um, assistance um, would be maybe one thing. Um, Cause I just, I know that there's not very many um, rules that are set for those people that are in that housing program. So um, that was just kind of one thing I really wanted to talk about. Um, um, and I think that's about it. <laughs> so thank you for letting me share my story. Thank you, Brittany. And um, can you, you know, just tell us a little bit of, of um, what's going on in your life now? You know. Uh, oh yeah. You know, of course. Everything. Yeah. Of course. Um, now I've got a job. I work with a sponsor. Um, I also see a counselor every week. Um, I work full time. Um, I live with a bunch of people that I've 
go out clean with. Um, I've got a really great support group. Um, I'm working my um, steps with my sponsor. I'm on my fourth step and I'm dragging my feet on it, <laughs> which I shouldn't be, but I am. <laughs> um, and things are just, they're going really great. Um, I know that the, there are times, you know, when things get rough, but I, you know, even on my worst day, it's still better than my best day when I was, you know, using. So I just kind of have to keep telling myself that when I go through tough times. And um, the other, you know, thing is, is that making sure that you've got to stay away from, you know, those uh, people, places and things that you used to be around that used to be bad for you. And um, I just got to make sure that I keep people around me that are good and positive. So. All right. Well, you know. It sounds like you are, you know, surrounded with a lot of caring individuals and, um, you know, just keep reaching out, you know, mm -hmm. you know if, if you need you know, any help. And um, does anyone have any, you know, questions, you know, for Brittany? Um, you know, a lot of positive comments in the chat, you know, just, you know, admiring you for, you know, being with us and sharing your story. And, you know, just, you know, you know, just, you know, continue, you know, to, to be there and work hard and, you know, keep moving forward. Thank I have you. a question. Yes, mm -hmm. Rebecca. Brittany, mm -hmm. don't drag your feet on your fourth step, do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and did you do any inpatient or outpatient anywhere? I did. I did inpatient at Gateway. Um, my sobriety date is three ten um, twenty one. There you go. Um, yep. And so I did that. I have not been doing outpatient. I kind of like before I even got out of rehab, I like got a job and I've been working and I had a sponsor and um, I was in a sober living though. Right when I got out of rehab for um, up until like this last month, I just moved out of the sober living. So. Okay. Good. Yep. I highly yep. encourage doing that taper down from residential to outpatient, though, even if it's just like going back to Gateway and doing an alumni program if they have it or something. Right. 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 But it sounds like you have lots of good support. So congratulations. Thank you. And don't push life too fast. Go at it slow. Definitely. We, yeah. For sure. Yeah, and um, Brittany, you did bring up a, a really good point about, you know, trauma-informed care and, you know, how we need to, you know, incorporate that in you know, all aspects of, you know, care, whether it's medical care, counseling, um, substance right. use treatment, and, you know, how it, it really um, is important to deal with the traumas associated with, you know, whatever is going on in someone's life. And so, um, you know, again, you know, thank you for, for mentioning that. And it is um, yeah. something that is, I, I think, you know, with healthcare providers speaking, you know, I know um, that's something that um, they are educating and, you know, trying to um, healthcare providers a little bit more on, on, on the importance of that, you know, when patients do come in uh, for a doctor visit, you know, it's not like, okay, what's your height, you know, your blood pressure, this, this, and that, you know, but also looking into adverse childhood experiences as well. And so, right. yeah. Right, okay. exactly. All right, well, thank you uh, for being with us. And like I just mentioned, keep up the good work. And like I said, you know, we have thank a lot you. of accolades in, in the chat. So thank you. And, you know, we hope to see you again. Okay. Thank you. And I think, oh, I do see Andrew, yes. All right, so um, I'd like to, you know, move on um, to our, our next speaker. Um, and um, Dr. Andrew uh, Mendonza, um, he oversees the clinical and uh, uh, program operations in the Sacramento County Substance Use Prevention and Treatment Unit. For over 15 years, Dr. Mendonza has been actively involved in the fields of substance abuse, mental health, and forensic psychology, and is considered an expert in these fields. He has worked in settings including inpatient and outpatient substance use abuse treatment, 
state hospitals, jails, juvenile detention facilities, lock treatment units, and segre segregated housing units within local and state systems. He is licensed to practice in over a dozen states. Uh, Dr. Mendonza has pre presented topics around the nation and the world, including um, Canada and Europe. And so today he's uh, going to speak on a very important topic on self-care and professional uh, preservation during a pandemic and uh, ways to identify burnout, secondary trauma, and te techniques to remain resilient. So um, please welcome uh, Dr. Mendonza. Hi, thank you so much for the warm introduction. Can everybody see my screen okay? Good, all right, well, thank you. It's an honor to be here. I, I love the work that we do here on the Opioid Coalition. Uh, super excited to be invited to present this topic. It is a topic that I'm passionate about. Anybody who knows me knows that I've been presenting on this topic well before the pandemic happened. And, uh, and definitely now more than ever, uh, we need this uh, information. And so what I'm gonna talk about today, this is a truncated presentation that I've done before uh, that's over three hours. So I am putting a lot into a little less than 30 slides. So I'm gonna give you a bunch of resources, a bunch of uh, areas to get some new information, additional information. And then my emails at the end, most of you know me, uh, but feel free to reach out to me. I can put a, a much more in-depth presentation together for you or for your organization, uh, share a ton more information for you. Uh, but this is really kind of a superficial, kind of a, a really 30,000 foot look at the topic. And so this is my kind of uh, my little catchy uh, topic that I like to use. Uh, as you know, we all have battery anxiety when we see our batteries getting down to 15 and 10%, so on and so forth. And so sometimes we're more attentive to our phone battery and our phone percentages, but we're not uh, too attentive to ourselves. So we really want to pay attention to um, to ourselves and how you know how um, self care is important and how burnout can really sneak up behind us uh, and not even see it coming. So one of the greatest quotes that I've seen, and it really kind of highlights really what I'm trying to get across today to everybody is the utilization of early screening tools, self assessment, and supervision strategies really can reduce burnout and early career departure uh, and improve your professional career satisfaction. I'm very fortunate to supervise a super great team here in Sacramento County. In addition to that, I do some other supervision outside of the county and I see folks burning out rapidly early in their career, like one, two, three, four years in where you would normally expect burnout to be happening on kind of the back end of the 10, 15, 20 year marks, seeing folks burning out really early. And so we really need to do more in getting in front of this as a profession, uh, no matter if you're in mental health, substance abuse, psychiatry, pharmacy, whatever it is, I think we all really have to take a look at this uh, problem that, that is really affecting our, our professional uh, areas and, and then taking out people in their personal life. So what I'm gonna be talking about today is kind of, um, it's, uh, you know, over, you have this overarching um, mentality in this topic called professional quality of life. It's what we all kind of strive for, right? We all got into our careers because we wanna have a professional life, a good quality life. Uh, from there, there's two things that kind of feed down. So depending on if you're doing it right or if you need some assistance, you either have compassion satisfaction, right? You're doing what you love to do. You're making a difference. You feel good about it. You're filling up your cup at the end of the day. And the next day you start out ready to go or you have compassion fatigue. And so that's where um, we're going to talk about a little bit more today. And then from compassion fatigue and a few slides I'll show you that actually drills down a little bit deeper from there. Uh, to where we really see uh, vicarious trauma, burnout, things that can really permanently affect you and affect your professional um, trajectory. So talking about compassion fatigue, compassion fatigue, I, I thought this was a great definition uh, out of Tulane. It's the compassion fatigue as a state experienced by those helping people, which is most of us here, right? Um, uh, people are animals in distress. It is an extreme state of tension and preoccupation with the suffering of those being helped to the degree that it creates a secondary traumatic stress for the helper. And so basically it kind of, it's just exactly what it says there, right? Is that we're so involved and so invested in making sure that we're helping our clients, our patients, whatever we're doing, that it's at the cost of ourselves. 
And if you think about it, it's kind of the, the metaphor is that saturated sponge, right? It's basically we've taken on so much from our clients and from our work and so on that we just can't take any more on, including our own needs, our own family needs, our own personal needs. There's just no sponge left. And so that's when you start to see divorce uh, issues in, in your personal life, um, you know, DUIs, all that kind of stuff. We start to see that other stuff kind of start to seep out. Throughout my slides, and I'll, put, and I'll supply my PowerPoint to Lauren, and she can send it out to everybody. Um, I'll, I, have, I put these little resource, uh, resource alerts. So when you get my PowerPoint, you can just click on the link, and it sends you to actually additional resources. I thought that's easier than putting together all these handouts for folks. You can basically just click on the link, and you'll actually get all the resources that are kind of applicable to this particular slide. So throughout my PowerPoint, you'll see these kind of resource alerts. Don't worry about writing it down or anything. You'll get the PowerPoint after and just click on those links and you'll have a ton more tools after we get done. So compassion fatigue symptoms, uh, very similar to a lot of other conditions that we might, we might be used to treating. Um, we, have, um, we have work uh, symptoms. So work dread or avoidance, and this isn't just Monday morning. Uh, it's kind of at another level of that, right? Lower empathy, we see absenteeism. So that's a, a telltale sign if you're managing people or if you're managing departments or organizations, you want to take a look at that, absenteeism. There's kind of a, a norm that we see in, 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 in the workplace. And then absenteeism is kind of beyond that normal absenteeism. Lack of enjoyment and professional fulfillment. So again, you used to be excited to go to work, to see patients, to help clients, whatever you were, whatever got you in doing what you're doing. Now, all of a sudden there's dread. There's, oh, I don't wanna do this or a oh, man, I'm really wishing my client would no show today. Damn it, they showed up today. There's that, there's that, that dread around doing what you used to love to do. You have emotional symptoms like irritability, anxiety, oversensitivity, uh, to things that maybe before really didn't activate you, really didn't matter to you. Now, all of a sudden, you're kind of oversensitive, especially when it comes to someone coming to you and saying, hey, are you doing too much? Are you, are you working too hard? Or, hey, you need to transfer some of your clients off your caseload. And you become extremely sensitive to that and extremely guarded around that. That can be a sign that, hey, you might be an over, you know, your, your sponge may be too saturated right now. Res uh, resentment around choosing the profession that you chose. Uh, I've coached a lot of professionals throughout my career. A lot of folks kind of around that 10 year mark or so are kind of like, oh, I really wish I didn't do what I did. If I had to do it all over again, I would have done something different. Most of us have those conversations with ourselves throughout our career, but really when it's like you really dislike the, the choices that you made in your life and you are really actively wishing that you hadn't done what you did. That's another whole level of, um, of resentment around, around client care, around your career, um, so on and so forth. And then poor concentration and, and judgment, all of us in mental health and substance abuse treatment, we all know that that's a symptom that's associated with a lot of diagnoses and a lot of conditions. But again, it's just more uh, one more kind of telltale sign that there might be something going on. Um, and in physical symptoms, don't forget a lot of people have emotional symptoms that um, come out and kind of masquerade themselves in physical symptomology. So you have headaches, GI upset, muscle tension, fatigue, insomnia, uh, heart, beat, heart issues, all those kind of things, weight gain, weight loss. Again, it's so stuff going on inside of you that's coming out in the physical sense. And so that may be, again, a warning sign for you that, hey, uh, that wasn't going on a year ago. What's going on? What's changed in my life? Oh, my job's gotten more stressful. We're down staff. Well, you know, we have a new, you know, we have a, a new director that is changing the way we do things. Th you know, again, those may be signs that there's something going on that you really want to take a look at. So as I talked about, we have the compassion fatigue. Well, so for compassion fatigue, if you don't really address it and you don't get it under control, it moves on to, to, to other issues. And as you can see, these are even more serious conditions that can really take you out of your career, really take you out of personal satisfaction in your personal life and really affect you, you know, overall as, as, a, as a person, as a therapist, as a counselor, as a leader. Uh, these can really be kind of, I call them career enders. So you have either burnout. So if you didn't get your compassion fatigue under check, you're gonna either move into burnout or you're gonna move into secondary trauma. So let's talk about secondary trauma first because that's the most serious of the two. Um, you have uh, pervasive cognitive and emotional changes 
in meaning and sense of self. See that a lot in first responders. Uh, you see that just, you know, really um, a permanent changes to uh, your cognition, to your emotions. You're almost dead inside, people have said. Uh, they've just seen body after body or military folks that have gone off and deployed. They come back and they say, you know, nothing activates me anymore. I've seen everything. And there's really this kind of sense of emptiness inside emotionally. Um, secondary trauma, stress, or vicarious traumatization. This can, again, if you're working in a field where you're being exposed to this information. Um, in my early career, my early life, I worked for the coroner's office. I was one of the people who came knocking at your door late at night when somebody died and I asked you to come with me to the coroner's office to identify the body. Saw lots of dead bodies in my life, uh, in my early career. And um, that really affected me. And I had to really kind of take a look at that because like not much activated me. I've seen, you know, after you see accidents, after accidents, I was like, that's no big deal. I've seen worse. And I was like, well, wait a minute. That's not good. That's not good that I don't even get activated by a horrific fatal crash um, because I've seen far worse. Like I should be activated. You should be activated. So if you're in these areas where you're getting extreme trauma saturation, you really want to make sure you're doing self-care. You're really making sure that you're connected with your own coach, therapist, counselor, peer group, whatever it is. Make sure that that is under control because that's pretty toxic stuff there. And then just like we would see with like post-traumatic stress disorder is kind of the re-experiencing uh, hyper arousal, hyper um, avoidance, not going to areas like, a, like if you're on the wellness crisis response team, for example, let's say you're out in the field and something horrific happened, maybe not wanting to be in that particular part of town anymore, um, whatever it is, it's just what we would normally say that sounds like PTSD. Well, again, that's kind of you um, becoming numb. You, you, you're really kind of becoming overwhelmed. Uh, with something and you're just not able to handle it anymore. So you basically just shut yourself off from it. So secondary trauma, it does qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD uh, in the DSM-5. Um, it often, it's often a slow onset. And like I said, it's kind of a, um, it kind of builds from compassion fatigue. If you get compassion fatigue in check, which we all experience compassion fatigue, it's actually a pretty common phenomenon in our profession. But, but if you can get that under control and keep it under control, it stays like that and it ebbs and flows from there. But if you don't, it kind of moves, like I said, into the secondary trauma uh, and it can really have a, you know, a really distinct effect on you, on your caseload. Um, you know, things like an incident, a disaster, a shooting, um, those kind of things can move you quickly into secondary trauma. And like I mentioned, um, what with the, the, the research is kind of saying, and again, I hate to, and I'm kind of pushing us all into 30 minutes, but um, you know, what the rule of thumb is basically you're looking at like the four, four week mark. So you had something, you, you're having some stress at work or something happened at work. And if it's been about four weeks and you're still experiencing this intrusion, avoidance, cognitions, things like that, that's where you're probably gonna wanna talk to someone, maybe reach out to EAP services, reach out to your peer group, whatever it is, and kind of talk through this. Because again, that's that, um, that, that warning light that it, at four weeks, if it's still going on and you haven't gotten under control, it's about to take a hold. It's about to, to significantly plant some roots uh, that you're going you're gonna to have to really deal with later. So really, you want to kind of keep that as your guidepost. If you're supervising folks, if you're out there in the field with working with your colleagues, again, just making sure that you're really doing that check-ins um, periodically uh, and, and not waiting for, you know, six weeks or two months or three months or whatever to do retreats and check in. It may be too late at that point. That four week mark is a, is a very important um, threshold that folks um, that folks are, um, you know, that we want to go and keep a keep a, a watch out for. So what is burnout? This is what I'm going to mainly finish out our presentation with today. Um, this is really what, you know, affects most of us. Uh, here in the room um, is that it, this is a burnout. Um, burnout is classified. It is an ICD-11. It is recognized by the World Health Organization. And basically it's a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. That's pretty much what WHO uh, and ICD-9 identifies it as. And again, as you read that, you can all, we're all going to say that's happened to us or it's happening to us. Uh, we know folks that, that, that uh, are affected by that definition. So that's really what we're talking about today. It's recognized as a serious occupational health condition in most sectors. So most EAPs, I think all EAPs, um, see that as a significant issue. And so certainly have um, resources for that um, condition for burnout. 
Um, as I mentioned down there, resource alert, feel free to click on that when you get the PowerPoint. And uh, those, there's some great resources for you and for your teams. Um, what I wanted to highlight on this slide is just that this is not a phenomenon that's been around from our grandparents and our parents' days. Uh, you know, this is a fairly new phenomenon. Uh, 50, only about 50 years ago, in the 70s, it was actually coined by a psychologist, and he actually referred to burnout uh, as uh, uh, referring to stress and exhaustion felt by those helping professions. And so that's what we're saying. This is a fairly new phenomenon. So there, you know, really, it's still evolving how we deal with it. The tools that we use continue to evolve. It's not something that's been around for 100 years. Um, and so it's, it's really neat that, um, you know, that it, it continues to kind of be a fairly new, uh, new thing that we're looking at in our fields, uh, in our professions. Uh, and there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of hope around it because, again, it's, it's something that's, you know, new and still being researched. Wanted to throw out some statistics for everybody just uh, so kind of see where things are in the state of the pandemic and kind of as we come out of the pandemic. Um, in February 2021, some research came out. Um, millennials, 59% uh, of millennials, 58% of Gen Zs, and 54% of Gen X had um, similar burnout rates, whereas baby, bur bur uh, baby boomers, sorry, uh, had about 31% of burnout rates. And so you, we could all probably argue this and hypothesize this probably the rest of the day about why that is. But the majority of folks that are entering or are new to the workplace um, are in those first three, genera uh, first three categories, right? These are folks that are either new career, early career, or have been in their career for a little bit of time. And so they're having, they're obviously at super high risk for burnout. Um, so again, if you're supervisors, if you're directors or managers or whatever, keeping that in mind that if you have staff that fall into these categories, they're experiencing significantly higher burnout rates than say you might be if you're a baby boomer or uh, you know, folks that have been around a little bit longer. Um, and employees struggling with burnout, about 63% more likely to take a sick day and about 23% more likely to visit the ER. Um, again, absenteeism is usually the first indicator. Um, I tell people if you're watching absenteeism at work, call out rates, now planned vacations, planned uh, sick time, all that kind of stuff, we're not talking about that. We're talking about call outs, no call, no, no, call, no show, those kind of things. That is where you're gonna wanna be paying attention. If you have a staff that's starting to do that, you're wanting, you want to get in there and figure that out because that is your first warning sign that something's about to get a lot worse. And some of the other, uh, another piece of research I wanted to highlight is nearly um, three in five employees report negative impacts of work-related stress, including lack of interest, motivation, energy, about 26%, and a lack of effort at work, about 20%. So fairly recent research that came out during the pandemic. Um, so three in five employees are being affected by burnout and being affected by um, stress at work. On the resource alert, alert there, um, if you feel free, if you want more kind of infographics, that's where you'll get those from. But I wanted just to highlight this for folks on the, in the meeting today. 52% uh, of US workers say that they're stressed at work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and as you can see, 95% of HR leaders blame burnout on an inability to retain staff. Most of us on this call know that we're in a staffing crisis in our profession. Uh, we're having a hard time attracting and retaining good staff. And burnout is another, another source of problems for us. So if you're already struggling with that, keep in mind that you may be putting more on your staff um, that could be pushing them to be one of these, percent, one of these um, statistics. So they, folks might be leaving because of opportunities, but you may be burning out your staff by putting too much on them because you don't have enough staff. And you know, I know the question always gets is like, well, how do, you, how do you deal with that? And I don't know the answer because again, we don't have a lot of staff laying around that are you know, wanting to work uh, in our profession right now. We all are going through staffing crisis. I have positions in my department I can't fill. And these are you know, county government jobs. Where I came from at the state, we have tons of six-figure positions we couldn't fill. So I get it. Like It isn't just because the job isn't attractive. We just don't have enough people out there to do the work that we're doing. And so again, just keeping that in mind that that may be loading into burning out your existing workforce. Um, some strong contrib uh, contributors of burnout. Um, when you think about your staff and think about yourself, these are things that we typically kind of look for as um, reasons why staff usually, uh, usually consider themselves burned out or they burn out. Um, lack of control. So in an in inability to influence decisions that affect your job. Um, and so I like to think that most of my staff would tell you that I do a lot of, what do you think? I'll defer to you. 
what do you want to do about this? Um, and so there, you know, maybe you can, maybe you can't do that in your staff and as you manage. But if you can, that gives people a sense of control, gives people a sense of the out, you know, be able to control the outcome a little bit. Uh, kind of in, in kind of uh, you, you're kind of uh, involved in your own destiny, right? Uh, that's what we're trying to get at here is, you know, whatever you can do to help your employee or your staff or yourself feel like more in control, do it. Um, unclear job expectations, another big one. And again, a lot of us are in crisis right now in the workplace. And so basically we're like throwing people in, do your job, and they don't really know what they're doing. They're fumbling around. Another, uh, another uh, really potent ingredient for burnout. Um, extremes of activities. Um, this could be the, you know, the, the monotonous job, chaotic, constant energy is needed to remain focused. Um, you're just basically like you are on 10 hours a day. Your phone's constantly monitored during the, the nighttime and the weekends. You really never get a chance to unplug. Those kind of that's that extreme. You're always on. You're just you're always going. Um, lack of social support. This is one that's been around for a long time, but I think now more than ever, it's applicable to our Zoom world. Um, isolation at work and in personal life are very, very potent uh, factors in burnout. And if you think about it, most of us today, right here, we're doing this meeting in a, in a Zoom uh, platform. And so we're really isolated interpersonally, if you think about it, unless you're really um, working hard outside of work to stay connected to people, you're already at risk for burnout just based on that one factor alone. And then work life and balance. A lot of us do side hustles on the side, do private practice on the side, consult whatever, teach, well, I know most of you on this call do more than just your day job. But again, keep in mind that you need to do kind of your work-life balance uh, versus your imbalance. Because again, you know, the more of these that you have, the more likely you are to lead to burnout. So keeping in mind that none of us are at fault, nothing, no one is to blame here. Um, I went through grad school, like a lot of you all on, uh, on there. I went through, uh, you know, training, professional training. And I don't know about you, but I didn't get a ton of uh, education on burnout and how to um, how to uh, change it and how to look out for it. Um, I supervise a couple of students out of Pepperdine, uh, and I'm happy to hear that they actually have a class now on burnout. But in general, the students I talk to say we don't learn about this stuff in school. It's scary. But what it tells you all is as folks are coming to your uh, employer and coming to your um, organizations, they don't know this stuff. And so it's really important for us as managers, as leaders, as uh, mentors to really, um, you know, to really make sure that we're doing this early career stuff with our staff, because we assume like, yeah, everyone knows burnout. Everyone knows how to take care of themselves. You'd be surprised. Uh, mo a lot of students I talked to are like, wow, you know, I give this little presentation during supervision and they're like, wow, we, we didn't learn this in school and they don't. And so hopefully that, that'll change, hopefully. But in general, it's kind of on us, right, as leaders and as mentors to, to teach our staff and our students this. Uh, many agencies focus on productivity over the well-being of staff. That's just a fact. I'm not going to make any judgments here, but we, we know organizations have to keep the doors open. They have to keep the lights on. And so it's pushing Medi-Cal billing, pushing productivity. Uh, and sometimes that can be at the detriment of staff. And then um, many agencies, a lot of the research will say that agencies that kind of focus on health outcomes um, are actually pretty positive, actually save money in long run. But again, it's that initial investment that a lot of folks are kind of standoffish on of, I don't want to spend all this money if I don't think it's going to result in anything. Well, the research is actually pretty overwhelming that if you invest in, in self-care and burnout prevention early in life, early in the employee's career or in your own career, you actually get money back. Uh, in the in, in savings and cost related to keeping that employee around. Um, so why care? A lot of folks ask me this. They're like, you know what? If a staff burns out, you just you just replace them. If I burn out, you know what? So be it. And so I have to remind folks, personal, family, relationship, health, because again, this is affecting your home life too. You bur you you burn out at work. You're burning out at home too. You're not you're not there for your kids, your partner, your significant other. You're not there for those that love you and who rely on you. Um, the quality of care. We all got into this into this work to do good work and to help to help people. But again, if you're burned out, there's only so much you can do. And now your clients and your patients think you're giving them 100 percent, but you're really only giving them 50 percent or 20 percent. And so the quality of care starts to diminish. 
Um, most of us are, are bound by professional codes of ethics, CCAP, Board of Psychology, Board of Behavioral Sciences, Medicine, Pharmacy. We all have board, we all have codes of ethics. So again, codes of ethics tell us that we should be doing quality care. Um, some of you are CARF for Joint Commissions uh, accredited. They, they demand this kind of stuff. They demand quality. Um, many of you that hold certifications or licensing, um, many of you don't know, I, I serve on the Board of Psychology as one of their enforcement experts. And I just say that because um, most of the cases that I get assigned to me and I have to decide is someone going to is someone needing to lose their license or not. Um, you can probably trace most of what they did wrong back to burnout, self-care, whatever, whatever. And these are folks that literally will lose their license to practice practice psychology, uh, uh, marriage and family therapy, pharmacy. I do some work with the Board of Medicine. Uh, you know, these are folks that are going to lose their license in their life. Um, and so, and a lot of the things you look at it, you interview these people and you're like, what happened? What went wrong? Why did your decision-making get so poor? And you find out they're burned out and they don't care anymore. And they're willing to make risky, risky decisions that will affect their, themselves and their clients. Don't forget about litigation. A lot of folks get sued for doing not so good things. Uh, organizations get sued. Again, this is because a lot of times you can trace this back to someone not making smart decisions because they were burned out. Um, organization success, reputation. We all know the organizations that uh, don't take care of their clients and their staff. We all know those that do. And so again, a lot of this can be traced back to a culture of burnout, a culture of not taking care of each other. Uh, and as I mentioned, a lot of times this is your career ender. This is where people are like, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. I'm done. I'm out. And they basically leave their um, they leave their career and they go do something else, or they or they you know end up you know living kind of miserable lives that they never thought that they would live. Uh, and it's kind of sad to see. So some risk factors came out of the American Counseling Association. I wanted to highlight since a lot of us in here do treatment or counseling or do um, social service ser uh, service delivery. There are some risk factors. So again, looking at these and seeing if these apply to your organization, um, if, if you're somebody that has some of these risk factors, these are, again, indicators that you may want to take a larger conversation with management, with your staff, um, large caseloads. And what the, the um, Counseling Association identified this as is outpatient caseloads greater than 60 or inpatient caseloads greater than 15. So I know I know I worked at a lot of places that were Medi-Cal clinics. I had caseloads of like 100. So I know that they exist. I know that not every organization can adhere to this. But again, if you're an organization that has um, ratios higher than this, then you know you need to be doing extra work to protect your employees and to protect yourself. If you have a, a trauma caseload, so a lot of folks like I love working with trauma clients and trauma informed care, whatever that, you know, whatever that passion is, you may have more going on in your caseload that may be heavy emotionally, may be heavy exposing you to trauma stuff. Uh, and again, that's going to be a risk factor. Um, back to back sessions. So a lot of folks in like private practice or who see like client care, um, you know, you're seeing clients from eight o'clock to five, back to back to back to back. Not a good, not a good uh, setup. Um, cumulative exposure of trauma clients. So let's say you have a bunch of long term clients and you've really been working with them for a long time and you've had long exposure to trauma over traumatization over and over again. Again, you're getting traumatized as your client's healing from their trauma, I assure you. Um, lack of clinical personal supervisor input. So if you don't have a supportive supervisor or a manager, you don't have a peer support, um, you know, you don't have any of that, a risk factor for yourself. Absence of any peer support, few resources. Um, um, uh, peers, uh, sorry about that, I just got um, sidetracked for a second, sorry. Um, few resources to refer patients. This is one that I, I really, a lot of organizations will ask me, hey, Look at what we're doing. What are we doing wrong? And then you find out they only have a handful of resources and they're not, they don't know about all the resources that Sacramento County or whatever county they're in have to offer. And so what that does is it puts that on to the staff, onto the therapist, the counselor, whoever it is, to have to find out all these resources. So you become this kind of savior complex where you have to find out all of the information on your own because your organization isn't connected or you don't know about the resources. So finding out about you know, what resources that the county has to offer and whatever you're involved in. So you have resources at your hands. Because again, the more you can put out to other people, the, the less the burden is, right? More people are helping your client than just you. 
And then professional isolation. I see this a lot with uh, folks that are doing private practice. They basically have their private practice. They're all by themselves. They see eight clients a day. They go home. They go back the next day. They see eight clients. They go home. And they have no professional interaction. They don't have a peer support. They don't have a mentor or anything like that. And they basically take it all on. They go home and they have nowhere to kind of process it, nowhere to kind of let it out. And that's an extreme risk factor. So if you're doing private practice, even if you're doing something on the side, um, try to make sure you're connected with peers or mentors that you can have kind of a peer support group to be able to process what's going on inside, inside your practice. So I'm a huge fan of, I can tell you what's wrong, tell you what to look for, but I wanna give you guys some tools to go home with tonight, uh, today. Um, and so I'm gonna go over a couple uh, assessments. And when I say assessments, I know I'm a psychologist. And so I do assessment, I get it. These are not those kind of assessments. We're not talking about MMPIs. We're not talking about Rorschach ink blots. These are assessments that are free source. They're available on the internet. They have great reliability and validity, and you can download them. You can use them with yourself. You can use them with your staff. If you're, if you're a clinical supervisor, I extremely, I encourage you to use it in clinical supervision. Make sure your staff know about these. Make sure you know about them. And don't be afraid to use them. Maybe your organization needs some help. Well, that's okay. The, the first step is to acknowledge that something's wrong. And this can be a good way to bring this to your management's attention, to you, your own attention. Maybe you just want to know for yourself how you're, how you're doing. So here are some tools that I want to, I want to present to you all today. And again, there's, there's going to be links in the PowerPoint that you can click on and you can direct access these. So we have the Professional Quality of Life Scale, the Pro QOL. It's free. It's 30-point um, self-report measure. It looks like this, basically. Uh, you go online down there. There's the link. You can click on it. You can just Google. You can just Google it if you want. It'll pop up. Uh, you basically score it on a Likert scale from one to five. And then at the end, it gives you, um, it gives you a score. It kind of gives you kind of your risks, where your risks are, where you're doing good, where you need some help. Uh, again, super helpful uh, if you're doing supervision. I do this with my students over at Pepperdine. Um, this, they do it in the beginning, in the middle, and at the end. So we keep a thumb on where their um, burnout is. So they get used to doing this. I want folks to get used to like, hey, it's time for me to do a self checkup. You log on, you do this really quick and just kind of track it for yourself. One of the best measures out there, free of charge, free, free source. You don't have to pay any royalty or anything for it. So feel free to use that. Another great uh, tool that I've used with folks and used at places that I've worked is the reachout.com. This is another uh, Likert scale. Uh, basically, it asks you kind of some things that you do. Do you do it or do you never do it? Um, create uninterrupted time, for example, never, rarely, just kind of on that continuum. And again, I think it's like 30 or so questions or so. And it gives you at the end, it gives you your results. It looks something like this or 28, sorry. It'll give you a score and it'll tell you some things that you might want to consider. Um, and so again, if you're not really sure, maybe you're like, hey, I know I'm not burned out. I'm great. Take the, take the test and just confirm it. Just to, you know, get, get a, you know, if you're doing a supervising some staff, take some time in a staff meeting uh, in your clinical supervision to do this. Uh, it's great. It can be a great team building experience. And you know what? It can be um, really eye opening for us as leaders because a lot of times we think like we're doing great jobs and our staff love us and no one wants to leave and no one's burned out. And then you do something like this and you're like, holy gosh, um, I was wrong. I need to make some changes. And then you need to then take that up the chain and say, hey, we're, we're, we need to make some changes here. And you have some, some data, some actual like information that you can share with your uplines to actually get some resources in there for your organization uh, and for your staff. Now, those two tools are great. Those are kind of the gold standard in self-care assessment. Um, but then a lot of folks are like, what do you do with it then? Well, one thing that you can do is kind of this called a self-care plan. And again, a lot of us who are therapists and stuff, we may get this, but again, not all of us are therapists and not all therapists know this stuff. So I want to put it out to everybody to use. There's a lot of areas for self-care. It's not just about going on hikes and meditating. There's a lot of things that can go into it. So this self-care plan, it can be super helpful. Um, and you can basically, this is, how, this is the one that I developed that I use with a lot of my staff. Uh, or a lot of my students, and uh, you know, you can do this. But basically, you're you're wanting to capture other areas because 
It's not just about work. It's about your psychological, your spiritual, your workplace, your relationships. There's a lot of areas that folks need to kind of take a look at uh, when they're looking at their overall self-care. So you want to make sure you do a, a very comprehensive overview. Uh, another great tool that I use is the mind tool assessment. And I think I have the, I don't have the link. Uh, I'm sorry, but you basically, you just basically Google, Google mind tool assessment and this will pop up and it's another um, Likert scale type thing. Uh, and it gives you some more, um, some more uh, data about where you are and kind of where you, you know, where you can go on self-care. Um, I've taken all three of them together throughout my life. Um, they have pretty good, um, uh, reliability with each other. Uh, you're not likely going to say one is going to say you're doing great and the other one says you're horrible. They all kind of in concert with each other. So, um, you know, feel free to use one or more of them at the same time. Again, if you're trying to build a case for some resource allocation or resource expansion, this can be a really great way, again, to kind of get some money or get some resources from your upline that uh, you actually have like data versus just like, well, everyone says that they're overworked. Well, Uplines you don't usually like to hear that, but hey, we did assessments, we did this, we did that. Here's the data. It's hard to really, it's hard to um, argue with that. Um, another tool, there's the link down there. A lot of tool that I've used when I do this in conferences is the self care wheel. Um, students love this. Uh, new early career staff love this. They basically do something like this and they put it up in their office or in their cubicle or whatever. And it's just a nice way for them to kind of get a reminder of things that they can be doing for all of these different areas uh, within their life and how to make sure that they're doing life balance. Um, I'm, I have this as part of a larger session. Uh, when, I, when I meet with students for the first time, they do their assessments, they find out the results, and then they develop their self-care wheel. And that's kind of their guidepost um, while they're working and doing professional care. Uh, it's just they have something to go to. We, we, you know, we would refer to this as kind of a safety plan, right? If we were doing safety planning with a client. This is kind of safety planning for yourself uh, and for your own self-care. So it's a nice way to make sure you're touching on all of those different areas. So I'll, I get asked this a lot. So why can't organizations just bring in a great motivational speaker, give everybody a day off, give everybody uh, everything, you know, bun cakes, and everyone will be happy? Well, the research is actually pretty telling. Uh, and what we know is that person-directed interventions are far more effective than organizational directed intervention. So what that means is when, you know, when HR says this is our new self-care and this is what we're doing and the employees had nothing to do with it and have no say in it, the results are not as robust as if employees do their own self-care or they're actually developing their own um, self-care plan. Uh, and so at, if, you're up, if you're high up in your organization, just keep that in mind because it's very tempting for folks to spend money on a motivational speaker and a retreat away for a day. And now we've done everything we can do and now everyone's great, right? We actually find that the research actually doesn't support that. So a combination of the two, combination of both person-directed and organizational-directed um, interventions actually have the um, far better outcomes and more sustainable outcomes long-term. Uh, with the organization and with the person. So as I talked about, um, how you might be able to use what I'm talking about today and the tools um, is basically, you know, using as part of after you hire a staff, consider doing this as part of a baseline, um, as part of a, hey, just getting to know you, maybe the staff does it by themselves and they keep their own numbers. Maybe you don't wanna be involved in those outcomes, but just something that you can help the employee get a baseline to themselves so that as you, they do these throughout their career, they know if, hey, man, my scores are getting higher or whatever, I need some help. You're giving them the tools of insight. You're giving them tools of self-analysis that can really be helpful for them to actually know because by the time they realize that they're in a bad place, it might be too late. So that's why you wanna kind of do this as early as possible. Um, as I talked about, I do this as part of individual supervision with my students. Um, I you know, do this, we go over, we talk about it, we talk about what can we do, what can we change, et cetera, et cetera. You can do quarterly assessment, quarterly, basically everyone tell everybody, hey, it's time to retake this. It's between them and their previous number. Maybe you make it part of a larger organizational thing. Again, it's just ways for folks to get insight into their issues. Um, one of the other things is uh, changing caseloads and clinical demands. Um, some of the research is basically saying, um, you know, shifting up uh, caseloads a little bit. And I know this is controversial because people are like, well, does that harm a client when you change their therapist and her counselor? And I think you have to do it from a clinic 
a clinical perspective and a case-by-case -case basis. Someone who's going through tons of trauma, who has maybe characterological disorders, um, yes, changing out their therapist too often can be clinically detrimental. But if there isn't that particular issue, changing up people's caseloads, so maybe folks aren't, aren't always sharing the heavy, the heavy clients, the high demand clients, that can be helpful uh, in people's caseloads. Um, remembering that you have a lot of early career folks joining our, our field right now. A lot of folks have been licensed or certified or in our field like less than five years. These are not folks that have been around the block a long time. So just remembering that is that we're asking a lot of folks that don't have a big foundation um, underneath them. And I, I don't oftentimes do a lot of this in like large group settings. So I wouldn't do this at, at a large staff meeting. Um, I might have folks say, you know, go home, do it. And then I, when we meet individually, we'll go over it. Um, but I would not have people sharing in a large group like, well, just so you guys know, like I'm burned out and sharing their numbers. Like it can be very isolating and it can be very um, degrading for folks. So if you're going to do it in a large group, do, you know, do larger stuff, but have them do their individual scoring and maybe have that as part of a one to one check in. Uh, um, so results of early assessment intervention, I kind of talked about if you can invest early, you get great dividends in the long run. Um, what we typically see out of the research, and this has been consistent pre and post pandemic, is decreased use, sick use time. And I'm not a big fan of people not using their sick time. I'll be honest. Like, again, I hope my staff will back me up here. But when my staff are like, hey, I need a, I need a day off from taking a day, I could care less. And maybe my boss will, will hate me for saying this, but you have sick time, go use it. If you're gonna go take a four day weekend, three day weekend, I could care less. Because again, if you're taking care of yourself, you're just gonna be a better employee for everybody. So I don't, use, I don't like to see decreased sick time as a, as a variable because I think that that can be overvalued. Because like, well now, you know, she hasn't used sick time in, in a year. Well, I don't know if that's a good thing. I don't know if that's a really good thing if for, them to have, for someone to have 600 hours of sick time. I hope that folks are using it for their own personal use. Um, increased longevity and low departure, so again, retention rates are, are typically a telltale sign, increased morale, um, you typically save money in recruitment, hiring, onboarding, because you know it, it takes two to three times more to replace an employee than to retain an employee. So again, if you're trying to, if you're retaining your employees, you're not front loading all that money to try to recruit new staff. Um, stronger interpersonal connections at work, which reduces that isolation, which is a risk factor. And then we know that it's overall better care for clients, which is what we care uh, most about. So you sometimes will hear this term called career sustaining behaviors or CSBs. Um, basically, these are the coping skills for mental health and um, helping professionals. Um, it basically is the more that you can do these things, the better off you are and the more protected you are around um, burnout and around um, issues um, that may take you out of your career early. So sense of humor, perceiving client material as interesting versus, uh, versus you know, I, I, I don't want to read this. I, I think my client's boring or my client's faking or whatever it is. Looking at it as, hey, this is kind of interesting. I'm learning something from this client. Engaging in leisure activities outside of work, using your consultation and relaxation. And the other thing you'll hear that's kind of coming out of this, uh, this line of research and, and interventions is this thing called micro behaviors. So a lot of times people, you'll see articles, I'll talk about, you know, what's your micro behavior between sessions? Or after you see a client, what's your micro behavior? And it can be something as simple as a quick body scan and uh, relaxation, maybe some progressive relaxation in your chair, get up, walk around your office, grab a glass of water, step outside, you know, whatever it is, those kind of things that break up the monotony of your day. That's called micro behaviors and kind of, the, and they're linked back to this career sustaining behaviors. The more you can kind of do those things, um, the better off um, you are, because again, you're, you're, you're just, it's not compounding the hour after hour after hour. You're getting a little bit of a release and a relief between clients or between appointments. And I know it's easier said than done. My calendar is horrific right now. I go from meeting to meeting. And I think most of you probably are the same. And so whatever we can do micro behaviors, even if we're just sitting at the camera, and we're doing some progressive relaxation or something in our body or doing a body scan, that can be extremely helpful. Last thing I wanna share with you, and again, you'll all get these PowerPoints, this PowerPoint, but there's a ton of tools here. And I just mentioned a few of them, but there are a ton of tools, a lot of things that you can do as groups, as departments, as organizations, as individuals. A lot of things I talked about, the assessments, there's links there as well. 
Um, but definitely, if you have a chance, take a look at these links when you get the PowerPoint. Some of it's out of Europe. Some really great research is being done out of Europe right now on this topic. Um, they're kind of ahead of us on it. Uh, and same thing with uh, Japan and uh, China are out uh, doing some good research on this as well, um, trying to combat the uh, issues of burnout and vicarious um, trauma. So take a look at those links if you, if you have a chance. I and mean, then most of you already know who I am, but feel free to reach out to me, send me an email, and I will definitely answer any questions that you have or send you any information I could possibly um, send and um, so on and so forth. So Janet, back to you. Thanks so Thank much for allowing you. me to do this. Thank you. Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments uh, for Andrew? You know, this is a very important topic and, you know, especially these last, you know, two years in, in every aspect of um, essential workers and healthcare workers and other, in this, um, throughout this pandemic, you know, has been uh, especially trying, you know, to combat, you know, um, the, the compassion, you know, fatigue and, and, um, and managing self-care, it's like self-care, what is that? So, uh, you know, it's always important to, to be, you know, reminded about that. Um, Andrew, I did have a question for you. So um, you had, in one of the researches, um, it said that uh, millennials, Gen Z and Gen X, you know, their um, burnout numbers were higher than the baby boomers. What, did, what do you think that's attributed to? Yeah, so some of the research, and I'm actually glad that I just see one of my colleagues on the on the email uh, or on the meeting right now, Andrew Wakefield, and I presented this topic around the around the country. So I'm glad he's here. So Andrew, feel free to jump in as well. I know you're an expert in this as well, but uh, I think the research that we were looking at on that is what that what that um, highlights is. Um, folks that baby boomers have kind of been through things and they've seen an outcome and they've recovered from it and they have this like um, they have this perspective uh, on it because they've kind of been through a lot. Right. And so the earlier that you are in your career, you haven't had that necessarily that perspective that things get bad, they get better, they get bad, they get better. And so there's a little bit of that. So the older we get, we call it kind of wisdom. Right. We have that perspective of like, you know, things will get better. Like we'll get through this as well. Um, if you don't have that, you, you tend to be kind of in that moment, you may not have that, um, you may not have that positive outlook uh, on, on life or on what's going on and work. And that may be uh, adding to why you have more burnout. Um, now, and who knows, maybe we'll see in another 15, 20 years, you know, that'll play out or we'll see that there's another reason why uh, millennials and other generations don't have or have higher burnout rates. It's just the research is super infant uh, in that particular area right now. And then are, um, are we seeing, you know, higher numbers in terms of, um, you know, suicide, um, suicidal ideation, you know, um, you know, attempts or, you know, um, you know, like with hotlines or anything, you know, with um, essential workers, healthcare workers, or, you know, just in general? I, um, I know the suicide rates have, have stayed pretty consistent. Uh, there's been some bumps here and there, uh, but as for like the uh, use, use of crisis lines, I, I have to defer to my colleagues on that. Um, I'm not sure on that. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, again, you know, I, you know, we, and I personally also appreciate this information. Um, you know, we all need to be reminded about the importance of self-care, you know, to you know, keep us, you know, our, our batteries recharged. I really like that. Um, that analogy so that you know we can continue our, our work you know that we are um, doing in this in our community so you know thank you again and you know we uh, will keep pushing forward <laughs> and right, so um, are there any other questions or comments or anything in general um, they are going uh, there is in the chat um, you mentioned uh, sharing the slides and how um, are you, um, it's, it's, how do we access them? That's the question. Lauren, do you have a preference? You want me to throw it in the chat or do you want to send it out or how do you want to do it? So um, yes, I'll, I'll send out a follow-up email, including them in there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. And so, you know, I'd like to, you know, again, thank all of our presenters today for uh, very informative um, topics. And uh, again, 
I um, like to remind everyone that you know we you know, we will be sending out a survey, so you know please look for that email. And our next coalition meeting is um, scheduled for July 18th at 2 p.m. Um, we are the executive board of the SAC um, Opioid Coalition. Uh, you know we meet. Um, to put together some topics, but, you know, we also, you know, want to hear, you know, from you folks as well, if there's any uh, speaker, if you have any resources that um, you would like to see at our coalition, you know, meetings, um, you know, please feel free, you know, to reach out and um, the um, email that Lauren will be sending out will have information on how to contact us. Um, so you can, um, you know, just let us know your thoughts that, you know, we could make this, um, these meetings uh, very meaningful as, as, you know, the one that we had today. So um, let me check the chat. No, nothing else in the chat. So again, thank you for your time and um, everybody stay safe and take care of yourself and be kind and, and all those good things. And uh, we'll see you soon. So, um, Everybody have a great afternoon. Goodbye. Thank you.